good afternoon, everyone in the East. Good morning uh, to those of you uh, in the Western part of Canada. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here with you today and to be here with this distinguished uh, panel of experts and members of parliament. Uh, so people who know what they're talking about and also who have the power to put that expertise into action. <clears throat> We're here to discuss uh, an incredibly important topic um, which is of, of great um, national importance, political importance, but also personal importance to our panelists. So thank you so much for joining us. My name is Daniel Bernhard. I'm the executive director of the Friends of Canadian Broadcasting. We are a citizens group that stands for Canadian culture and democracy on air and online. And we are here to host this event today because we believe that decency and democracy are fundamental characteristics of Canadian culture. And so this um, uh, topic is, is really germane to, to our supporters across Canada and, and to our team here at Friends. I'd like to uh, thank our partners uh, in hosting this event, uh, the Samara Center for Democracy, and I'm glad that Adelina is here representing them. I'd also like to welcome Professor Heidi Twarak and Chris Tenov um, from the University of British Columbia, who've published a fantastic paper, um, Being Trolled on the Campaign Trail, which will form the basis of our, of our discussion today. And I'd also like to welcome our distinguished guests, members of parliament, uh, Charlie Angus, Bob Zimmer and Ikra Khalid, um, who are here to offer not only their expertise and make no mistake, they are experts in this subject matter, um, but also their personal experience and perhaps shed some light on um, the way forward for Canada and for our democracy. So um, before I proceed and uh, ask uh, Adelina to join us um, and, and give some opening uh, thoughts about um, Samara's interest in hosting this, I would just like to um, remind all of our panelists to please um, do better than I just did and please speak slowly and clearly. Um, this event is being um, uh, interpreted simultaneously for our uh, Francophone audience. So please be kind to the interpreters or I will suffer their wrath. So it's one of those do as I say, not as I do moments. And I promise uh, to, to keep the rule myself. Um, pour uh, nos uh, spectateurs uh, francophones, nous sommes disponibles à, à prendre vos questions, vous pouvez poser vos questions dans la section en bas euh, en français. Nous avons des, des collègues francophones qui peuvent prendre vos questions. Moi, je vais les traduire et euh, les poser euh, aux panélistes. Leur réponse peut être livrée en anglais, mais la traduction euh, sera présente pour vous. Euh, donc, cet événement est pratiquement complètement bilingue. For um, everyone else, this uh, event is meant to be interactive, so please um, post your questions in the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are here uh, on a computer and not on a telephone, you can see the Q&A function. Please pose your questions there and we will get to them as soon as we can. One final word, if you'd like to stay in touch with the friends um, or keep uh, in touch of this uh, with, with, with us on this subject matter, um, feel free to uh, follow us on Twitter at FriendsCB or me personally at SendInTheWolf. And you can also view our research on this subject at friends.ca slash platform for harm. Um, we'll maybe talk about that later, but today is not for our research, it is for UBC. And before we get there, let us turn to Samara. Uh, Adelina, if you have just a, a moment, please, about uh, why Samara is here to host today. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with the Samara Center, we are a nonpartisan charity dedicated to strengthening Canada's democracy. And so we produce action-oriented research that um, kind of uncovers the evidence uh, and reforms needed to make Canadian politics more accessible, more responsible, and, uh, and inclusive. Um, so I'd especially like to thank Sarah Andrews from Friends of Canadian Broadcasting uh, for setting this up today and all the panelists for taking part. So early in the pandemic, the Samara Center held a Zoom webinar with political interns. And about 20 minutes in, someone Zoom bombed us. Um, it, was, it wasn't targeted, you know, was, as far as I know, it was completely random that someone showed up, uh, they played loud music, they drew some crude images on the screen, and we were able to shut it off in seconds. 
Um, so in theory, being able to connect online is an amazing thing for democracy. But in practice, uh, things have gone wrong. Um, we behave differently online. We, uh, we converse um, on social media in a much more angry way than offline. And harassment and extremism thrive in this environment. So blocking someone uh, from a Zoom conversation is, uh, is something that works temporarily, uh, but it doesn't tackle the issues that now plague the digital public sphere. Um, a 2019 study of 54 countries found Canadians are the most likely among all the countries uh, to see social media as damaging to democracy. And the research supports public opinion on this one. Incivility online has real costs to the health of our democracy. It can turn people off politics, both offline and online. It uh, disproportionately affects groups already underrepresented in politics. It's making polarization worse. You know, incivility erodes our trust in one another um, and causes us to have a greater dislike um, for people from other parties or other ideologies. And it even makes us more vulnerable to other um, manipulation by harmful online actors, which can include you know, foreign actors who take advantage of the incivility online, often during elections, of course. So most governments are moving towards regulating social media, but the initiatives differ in the severity, you know, and effectiveness and um, tricky questions remain, um, including how to reduce harmful behavior while um, also allowing for free political expression you know, um, how to treat social media under the law. Um, and, you know, do we need new laws or new ways to enforce existing laws? And whether or how to bring algorithms under um, public control. So the same study that found the Canadians were most worried about the effects of social media also found that only 40% of them uh, want more regulation of content uh, shared on social media. So whatever solution Canada comes up with, it will be an uphill battle um, to get the public on board. But having cross-partisan conversations like the one we're having today, backed um, with strong research, is a necessary step forward towards a solution. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing and learning from all participants today. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Adelina. And thanks again to Samara for co-hosting this event with us. Uh, une note de plus pour uh, nos amis francophones. Vous pouvez entendre la version interprétée et en français en appuyant le bouton de traduction en bas. Il y a un bouton à côté de, de, uh, du uh, chat et du, uh, du uh, bouton pour poser vos questions où vous pouvez uh, choisir votre langue préférée and uh, the version français sera là pour vous. Thank you again. Before I get to the main event uh, of uh, discussion with our members of parliament who are waiting so kindly um, here in the wings, I'd like to turn it over to Chris um, from the University of British Columbia. Um, Chris and Professor Torek, who uh, will join in the discussion a little bit later, um, have done some really fascinating um, empirical research about the impact of social media or the use of social media um, politically and the impact on candidates for public office during the 2019 election. So um, Chris, the uh, floor is yours for five minutes. Um, if you could uh, give us the highlights of your research and then we'll, we'll get into the implications. And I'm sure if there's anything that's missed, we'll be able to catch up um, during the Q&A. So over to you, Chris, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm happy to be a warm up act uh, today. Um, uh, I'm honored to be joining you from Vancouver um, and from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples here. And thank you also to the organizers. Um, so uh, I, um, pardon me here a second, there we go. So what I want to do is just give a quick snapshot of this report that Daniel mentioned that, that Heidi and I wrote um, and, and researched along with some colleagues at UBC and some other universities. Uh, to do this study, what we did is we interviewed 31 candidates who ran in the uh, candidates or their campaign staff who ran in the 2019 federal election. 
as well as about a dozen other elected officials at other levels of government. And then we also did a analysis of over a million tweets that were English language tweets that were directed at candidates during that 2019 election. And we used an algorithm to categorize these tweets on a scale from positive to what we call high negativity. So here's what we saw. Um, as you can see there, about 1% are what we call high negativity tweets. And those are threatening or hateful or denigrating. About 15% are medium negativity tweets. Um, and those are usually explicit insults. And about 25% are what we call low negativity, which are dismissive or somewhat disrespectful. So you can see those categories of negative um, tweets and then compare them to just 7% that are positive. So I think that gives you a sense of the tenor, um, or you might say the toxicity of online discourse during an election. So we focused um, on the abusive tweets, which are the, we, are the high negativity and medium negativity categories to see who were these being targeted at. Um, and what we found is that um, a small number of, sorry about that, a small number of candidates get the majority of abuse. Um, in fact, almost 70% of the abusive messages uh, went towards just these seven candidates. And you can see those are the five national party leaders plus uh, a couple of prominent MPs. By contrast, most of the candidates in our database got less than 30 abusive messages over two months, um, which is still too many, of course, but uh, it gives you a sense that um, some of the accounts we hear of the torrents of abuse that are indeed directed at a small number of people running for office or in office are not necessarily the experience of everyone. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, I should say even smaller numbers of abusive messages are challenging, especially for candidates who are less prominent, less well-resourced, maybe don't have trained staff to assist them. And also we are only able to focus on Twitter. Um, and some of the interviewees told us that they got more serious and more frequent abuse on Facebook. Um, we were unable to access um, that type of types of Facebook data we would need to investigate this. Um, and I think that's a, an issue that we might return to later. One finding that that surprised us is that we did not see that women or racialized candidates got higher proportions of abuse in general. But every non white candidate and almost every woman candidate um, told us that they faced at least some online abuse that attacked their identity. So the issue here is more about content than about frequency, at least in terms of what we saw. Um, explicitly racist or sexist or homophobic messages make up a very small proportion of content that we saw in our Twitter database, um, but they have a serious impact. And they do in part because they mirror or they even amplify the forms of offline discrimination or threat that people face. Um, and they add just uh, another obstacle um, to running for office that are already faced by people from um, less well-represented groups. Uh, furthermore, there are um, high-profile women and racialized uh, candidates and office holders who do receive um, tremendous amounts of abuse, and that is interpreted as sending a message um, to others about what they might face. So that's a, a very quick snapshot. I'm happy to talk about more of our findings, but I just wanna pull out what I think are a few key um, issues that come from our research um, that we need to address. Um, one is that um, there is a, a small amount of material that is um, possibly illegal that could perhaps be dealt with um, through uh, criminal or civil um, legal mechanisms, but those are going to be slow and costly um, and um, often inaccessible for users. So we need to find ways to deal with these small amounts of, of really poisonous content online. There's a much larger amount of online content that is, is uncivil or disrespectful or antagonistic. Um, and people may disagree about how problematic it is or whether it should be removed. Uh, and we need to think about how to deal with that larger category. Um, but I think that most people 
do agree that we need to find ways to have healthier online conversations um, to improve the quality of democracy. And there are lots of different ways to do this and, and not only through um, removing content. So an important thing to think about is design changes um, that might um, lead platforms to be more um, receptive or more likely to promote healthier conversations and encourage productive engagement. Um, and that could include more user tools. And a lot of candidates and politicians told us they wish they had more tools to control um, their engagements. One that does exist is blocking, but that comes with some real um, important questions. And we might wanna talk about that later as well. And just the last point I'd make is that um, this isn't just a social media platform problem. Um, social media are often acting as a mirror and sometimes a very helpful mirror for sexism and racism in institutions. Um, and more broadly in society. Uh, and also uh, a range of organizations, including political parties, play a role in contributing to the toxic discourse um, and can do more to address it. So that's uh, a quick run through some of what we uh, de develop in our report. You can find it online if you're interested. Um, there are lots of ways to address this issue. So I'm really excited to talk about how we might do that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Chris. Thank you for um, setting the table for us here today. Um, I see already that questions are coming in. So if you've just joined us, um, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom. This is an interactive event. Uh, we will make it such uh, to the best of our abilities. Et uh, vous pouvez aussi uh, poser vos questions en français. Uh, nous, allons, nous allons les traduire et, uh, et, et les répondre aussi uh, tout ensemble. So, uh, let's turn right now to our guests of honor. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Bob Zimmer, um, Conservative Member of Parliament from Northern British Columbia, um, Charlie Angus, uh, New Democrat from uh, Northern Ontario, and um, Ikra Khalid from the Greater Toronto Area. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to uh, start with you, um, please, uh, Ikra Khalid. Let's um, uh, see if you can tell us what has your experience been? <clears throat> We've just heard from the University of British Columbia that um, abuse uh, and uh, harassment of political candidates online is pervasive, perhaps not evenly distributed, but it seems like everybody gets some of it. Um, is dealing with abuse, uh, some of it violent, some of it threatening, um, other uh, parts of it simply just obnoxious or, or toxic, is this now uh, the price of admission to participating in public office? Uh, thank you so much for that question, Daniel, uh, and thank you uh, to Adelina and Chris for, for your presentations. Um, that's a really important question, uh, Daniel, and I, I guess I'll share some of my, my personal experiences. Um, one message uh, that somebody had sent to me, um, uh, and I, I, I will use blank instead of profanity, uh, he said, blank you softly with a chainsaw. Um, and uh, and I, I I had read that out in uh, in Parliament when I was going through um, when I tabled a motion uh, to combat Islamophobia, uh, and uh, you know that was amongst uh, tens and thousands of messages that uh, that I had received, but I'd also received a lot of positive messages as well, you know of of encouragement and and I think uh, the the takeaway that I have, uh, you know, over these past number of years uh, on this topic of uh, of uh, combating online hate and to make sure that there is a, uh, a safe space uh, for people to engage in in dialogue um, is that it's it's not an easy uh, task. Um, obviously, as politicians deal with it uh, on a regular basis and based on the stats that you had provided. Um, party leaders tend to deal with it a lot more than um, than uh, than those that are not party leaders. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we're engaging in uh, and and making sure that there is a platform for everybody to engage in. Uh, and one thing that I've been told by my constituents quite regularly uh, is that they're sometimes fearful of engaging on my social media platforms. Um, because they're afraid uh, of being targeted by some of these people that, that watch the social media platforms and then attack the people that are commenting uh, maybe in a positive way or, or whichever way uh, on, on, these, um, on these platforms. 
Um, but I, I do uh, have a question is that how does uh, reporting uh, of uh, tweets, uh, and then I know that a lot of your data had just focused on tweets, how does uh, reporting tweets impact your data? Um, I mean, I know tweets get removed uh, once they're reported and that they're found to be in violation, et cetera. Um, but, you know, like it's the conversation and that balance between free speech and free uh, or safe space. Uh, is an important one and politicians uh, are a bit in the thick of it, uh, it would seem. Well, looks like we have a question for our researchers from the University of British Columbia. So uh, Chris, Heidi, um, do you have an answer to that question? Sure, I can, I can just quickly jump in. That's on what we do about um, reported messages. So um, the way we were looking at tweets um, is that we could see them as soon as they were streaming through Twitter. So if they were subsequently taken down, we could we still access them. So we were seeing kind of the raw, unfiltered stuff. But a lot of the worst messages had been taken down when we tried to find them again sometime later. So, um, so Twitter's algorithms or flagging processes are getting things. And of course, um, we can't see how often people are reporting but we do know that um, some candidates found it a very effective way to address problematic material. And some thought that um, they didn't know enough about whether it was working or it seemed very inconsistent in its in, uh, application. Great. Um, I, I wanna follow that up with a question for, uh, for you, Charlie. And uh, I should say to everyone watching that uh, I did ask all of the uh, participants here while they are members of political parties, um, not to turn this into a, a partisan slugfest. Uh, we could watch Power in Politics later if we feel like it. But um, for now, we're just discussing personal experiences. But Charlie, um, partisans are part of the issue. And one of the interesting um, aspects that I found from the report is that you know, uh, hyper-partisan uh, users, not necessarily members of the parties, but, but sometimes their adherents, are, are really driving this. And it seems to affect um, all parties, that there are people who, who hate them and will come after them. Uh, so it's, it's not one or, or the other in particular. I was wondering, what do, what do you make of the role of political parties or their adherents um, in this problem of aggressivity and abuse online? Um, what's, been, what's been your experience, um, both as a potentially uh, a target of it, but also as an observer of people um, who, who support you or your colleagues who engage uh, in this type of behavior uh, against uh, opposing parties? Well, I think that's a really good question because to me, looking at this, I see three main areas. Um, there is the breakdown of public conversation and discourse, which I think is our personal responsibility. There's a secondary level, which maybe we can get to on the responsibilities of the uh, the platforms in terms of the algorithms. And Bob Zimmer and I did a lot of work on that, the toxicity that is driven by the algorithms of, of extremism and disinformation that drives people. And then I think there's a third issue, which is on the issue of how do we actually get compliance when we're dealing with police, when we're dealing with uh, the platforms, when we're dealing with actual on, online threat possibly becoming real. But I would say um, in terms of this being a nonpartisan issue, there are toxic levels of trollism at every, in every party. Um, and you know, I, it's funny for me, I live on the partisan side. I'm always the one who's in the middle of partisan fights. Uh, so, but what I see in terms of the online stuff is a serious uh, breakdown that's starting to occur in terms of how we talk about one another. Um, the amount of, I never heard 17 years ago, people refer to the prime minister as a traitor who should be hung. Um, I hear that all the time now from partisans or, you know, that, uh, that the leader of the conservative party is a fascist. Well, you know, I never liked Stephen Harper. I didn't call him a fascist. It wasn't a part of a normal conversation. What I do is I call people out and I say, listen, that's, you know, I might not like someone from another party, but they shouldn't get hung. Uh, they aren't traitors. They aren't, you know, extremists. They represent p the political parties of our country. And it's amazing. I think the, as we, as we, as the push online to dissolve us, to, to, to divide us into more and more firm camps, even when I'll post an article, I'll have someone say, I never read that paper because that paper is left wing or that paper is right wing. I don't read them. That's fake. 
And so this whole idea of fake news being actually dividing us so we can't even have a conversation. I like to say to people, well, you, you might, might not like the editorial policy, but I'm writing, I'm posting an article because it's up for conversation. And I think we have to do a lot better, even with our own people to say, tone it down a little bit. And to that, I would say that on my own page, I've learned that there are people who come on to start fights. There are people who come on to try and get control of your uh, of your feed. Um, I had to block them. I, it's a policy now. If you're on my page to create dissension, if you're on the page to pick fights with people, go someplace else. This is a place for conversation. And I found that since I've started to do that, public conversation on the page has gotten a lot more respectful and people are more willing to listen to each other because at the end of the day, we need to have that sense of a public conversation that is still possible that we can hear each other across. We don't have to agree on each other's politics, but there are elements in every political vision that adds to the whole of who we are as Canadians. So on that level, I'd say that's our responsibility and our responsibility as citizens engaging to realize that some of these, it might be fun to act like a troll sometimes. It might, you might feel great dis disrupting, but it can have toxic consequences if it becomes uh, the driver of public conversation or the, or the disruptor of public conversation. Interesting. Thanks, Charlie. I, I, I do have a question for Bob Zimmer, who's been waiting here patiently, but just quickly, mm -hmm. one quick follow up, maybe just a yes or no, um, Charlie. So when you do um, reprimand, I suppose, uh, people who are, you know, um, generally politically aligned with you who are uncivil to, you know, the Prime Minister or, or the leader of the Conservative Party, are you finding that they are responding? I find that a lot of people um, do. And the people who don't, well, they're going to probably end up getting kicked off my page sooner or later. So, uh, but I think it's, it's sometimes it's just important to say, hey, step back a bit. You know, it's, mm. um, uh, this isn't, you know, like, and again, trying to divide region by region um, of trying to say things that people know aren't true. They're angry. Mm. Uh, and, and anger is okay. People are frustrated, but there are levels where we have to just say, you know, that's, that's not fair. And especially when we're talking about threats of violence, people may just think they're, they're expressing their emotion. But after a while, if we keep using violent imagery for dealing with people we don't like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we end up with what happened with Joe Cox in, in the UK, where, where someone will get killed. And yeah. that's, that's something I think we have to consider the possibility that that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, Bob Zimmer, one of the interesting findings from this report was um, that, and Chris mentioned it earlier in his opening comments, that mm -hmm. there is a distinction between what um, uh, I have heard described, and I've now started to use this term, between content that is awful but lawful yeah. um, and, uh, and content that's just straight up illegal. Mm -hmm. um, thinking of death threats and you right. know incitements to violence and things, and I mean the conversation extends further. You know uh, the ethics committee is discussing Pornhub right now. Yeah. Um, you know, um, and that's also illegal user generated content for another day. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this line is important though because you know people have been mean in politics um, yeah. from time immemorial, and I don't believe that anyone uh, thinks it's a good idea to ban that. At the same time. Um, respect is important and the, mm -hmm. uh, the gatekeeping function that used to protect um, the conversation to some extent um, is, is now you know, completely a sidestep. So where, where do we draw this line? You know, when we're trying to think about how to tackle this problem, there's the incivility and there's the illegality. Right. They're both problems, um, mm -hmm. but they merit different responses, perhaps. I know this is a question you've thought of uh, a great deal uh, when yeah. it comes to content moderation. Maybe you can just tell us where your thoughts are right now about that difference and the impact of those two types of content on uh, people running for political office. Yeah, yeah, and uh, thanks for the opportunity again and uh, say hi to my colleagues that are here with me. Uh, as Adelina said, she, uh, she said it's very difficult to tackle because we can see what the problem is. We can see uh, the e illegal posts, as you uh, mentioned them, but we also see the offensive comments. Uh, I guess the question with the illegal seems obvious. You know, they shouldn't be allowed to be posted, um, something that you've already described. But one that um, is political discourse, um, and this is where it becomes problematic. What, what I see, uh, we see the social media platforms decide 
who they're going to listen to and who they're not going to listen to, who they're going to allow to be on their platforms, who they won't allow to be on their platforms. And it's uh, it, it becomes a really fine line of, uh, you know, an example would be a, a candidate makes a claim in a, in a uh, campaign. Uh, I could see how truthful that particular claim was. The other person, even one of my colleagues here could say, well, they could counter that with saying that's not true. But we both could prove it that we're both right. So who decides on who's the fact checker to say who's right in that particular instance, right? Uh, if it's something that's obvious, it might be easy. But when we talk about political discourse, it gets to be this gray area. And then who's going to police that? And, and that's where I guess I can get concerned about the social media platforms policing this them, themselves. And we've seen um, many times in our studies, even with our international grand committee, they're not very good at it. Uh, and I see they're actually trying to do a little bit better, but uh, very concerned that we're giving uh, these these uh, social media platforms that are huge tools um, that and, and can be directed. We, we've seen, even seen them uh, becoming weaponized, that they're in the hands of, of, of people in boardrooms that might have profit as their motivator mm -hmm. and not necessarily the health of our democracy or the health of our, our citizens. So uh, very concerned about uh, that that particular huge power that those uh, folks hold. And are you concerned about the discussion going too far? Oh, absolutely. So uh, and the way I've thought about this a lot, and again, the, the challenge is what to do about it. Uh, it's one thing to, like if somebody was saying something harmful to somebody else, absolutely that that should not be allowed. We're talking about uh, section seven of our constitution right? It, uh, everybody has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. And if somebody's saying something that's threatening that, that shouldn't be there. But there's another, you know, we can say things that sometimes offend each other. And um, I think that that can be political discourse. And I would use uh, somebody, uh, Chris, I think you brought up racism. I think in our country, our country's gotten a lot better because there's been a discourse about this. It hasn't stayed where it's been a uh, hundred years ago. It's because of, the, because of that public discourse and discussion and, and uh, you know, rubbing shoulders with guys like Charlie and Ikra in the House of Commons that we've all gotten better, you know, that's, mm -hmm. and that, because that discussion has been allowed to occur. So sometimes it's not always going to be an agreeable discussion, but that discussion needs to occur. So uh, I guess where, where, where it crosses the line, I guess, is the question you asked, is when it's harmful to somebody else. Okay, thank you very much. Just a reminder uh, to please post your questions in the Q&A below. We have uh, about 30 questions so far. Hopefully we can uh, have some more. Um, our staff are looking at them. Um, uh, vous pouvez aussi poser vos questions en français. Je suis content d'avoir uh, quelques uh, uh, questions en français parmi les autres. Um, the uh, question, Bob Zimmer, that you raised about how to police this is, of course, uh, a very live one. And you know, for that um, reason, we are of course blessed to have with us not just a member, but the chair of the House of Commons Justice Committee, um, uh, Ms. Khalid. Uh, now, I know uh, this isn't entirely um, in front of the committee, but you know, I've I've written about this in discussions about the current uh, Pornhub uh, scandal, but also in terms of uh, the role of Facebook in um, helping to facilitate the incitement of violence. I'm not just talking about the Capitol riots, but um, even in Michigan last year, the people who proposed to kidnap the governor of Michigan um, because they didn't like her policies towards COVID-19, um, they put videos of themselves building bombs on Facebook and they posted um, uh, progress updates. Facebook says that they, um, that they take uh, this content very seriously and that they take it down. Um, you know, Kevin Chan spoke to the Heritage Committee a couple of weeks ago where he talked about all of the great efforts that the company is making to take this stuff down in good faith. And then, of course, the Wall Street Journal reports that, you know, 70 percent of their political groups violate their own terms and that the executives haven't taken it down um, because uh, it would be unprofitable to do so. I mean, I was a little bit aghast at the possibility that Facebook's representative in Canada wouldn't tell the truth to Parliament, but alas, crazier things have happened. So um, this is all in front of you right now, and there is a question of responsibility, and there is a question of responsibility for the platforms. Dealing with safety and um, civility is one question, but you've received threats. Um, other people have received death threats. Um, is, is there a simpler answer to some of this? Uh, should we just call the police? 
Uh, thanks for that, Daniel. And uh, and yes, in 2018, um, our Justice Committee had conducted a, uh, a very wholesome study into what uh, online hate looks like, um, its impact on Canadians, and uh, and we put forward uh, some concrete resolutions uh, and recommendations to our government uh, on how we should be combating that. Um, and one of the big questions uh, that, that we have, uh, and since then, uh, really uh, endeavored to kind of find a solution to is one that you've raised. What is the level of responsibility to whom um, to, to really tone down that, uh, that violent uh, rhetoric? The way that I see it, um, I think that um, as a government, uh, we can, at the very least, really address what is the most obscene, the, what the, the most harmful, the most uh, insightful type of hatred, uh, and, and really uh, pursue through our criminal code um, a, a framework that already exists uh, to, to really address and to, uh, to penalize those people that are that are inciting that kind of hatred uh, and targeting uh, people uh, you know and, and threatening them the responsibility of social media platforms I think uh, is an important question uh, we've seen in um, in, in other uh, countries especially in Europe in Germany uh, frameworks that have been created uh, where uh, you know there there are regulations for social media platforms uh, it, to be held accountable for uh, what their platforms are used for. Now, what we, and, and I think all Canadians appreciate and respect this, um, is finding that balance between what is uh, outright, uh, you know, violent, uh, harmful hatred that is being shared on social media platforms versus uh, I, the, you know, the other opposite end of it is, is that safe space for people to engage in, in what is that uh, really important dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, you know, there are a number of things um, that, uh, that I, I'm a strong proponent of. And one of the things that our report had recommended um, was uh, in our uh, human rights code, uh, there was previously what is known as a section 13 uh, that created a civil remedy uh, for individuals that were targeted uh, because of, of this hate, um, you know, uh, through uh, social media platforms or online platforms. Um, I, I personally would like to see this to be reinstated uh, in, in whatever form uh, to, to make sure that there is a remedy for, for an individual that is harmed by, um, by the hatred uh, that, they, that they receive. Mm -hmm. um, but with respect to social media platforms, um, I think uh, that uh, conversation um, around what is really explicitly hatred. I think we can start with that, uh, you know, and you'd referenced Pornhub and, uh, you know, with that child exploitation uh, is a huge uh, issue that is existing in Canada and across the world. I think uh, that is a good place for us to start and, uh, and to start regulating uh, those online platforms where such abuse exists. Can, can I just ask you a follow-up question quickly? And then I have one more scripted question and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. Um, you talk about other countries that have regulations. Um, you just said that this is a place to start. You mentioned Pornhub. Now this is obviously not about civility and politics, um, but uh, surely we don't need a new law to tell us that trafficking in child pornography is illegal. Um, and when it comes to um, uh, political violence, you know, um, threatening death against a candidate, um, I could send a letter to the editor of the Globe and Mail right now um, saying that the prime minister should be hung, um, you know, or, or, or something to that effect, or, or that I intend to do so myself even. Um, the, the, the editor of the Globe and Mail, though, doesn't have to put that on the front page. Um, and should he elect to do so, he'd go to jail um, as an accessory to this uh, illegal act under long-standing existing Canadian law. He would be liable to do that. So my question for you is why should Facebook executives, for example, not be subject to the same treatment if their platform is being used to threaten death, violence, again, on the illegal side? Um, surely we already have laws for dealing with this. Um, do we need to start somewhere? Haven't we already started? Well, Daniel, the issue is the safe harbor provisions that we put in place that protect them. Um, you know, when Bob Zimmer and I had 
Kevin Chan uh, at our first set of hearings, and we asked about the mass killings in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, they were identified by the United Nations of being complicit in mass killings. And they were like, well, we're on a journey. Nobody's perfect. Um, can you imagine someone saying that in any other time in history uh, and not getting bounced out of the room and maybe slapped in irons? Uh, we learned about mass killings in Sri Lanka that were tied to the platforms, mass killings that have happened in Africa. Um, and, you know, the platforms always tell us they're going to do better. We've got this Pornhub study underway and we're being told, don't worry, we have legislation coming. I've looked at the criminal code. We have as best child pornography uh, laws you can imagine. Mm. And yet none of these companies have ever been charged. So why mm. is that? It's, we have to start saying that these safe harbor provisions will not protect when it comes to issues of violence, issues of hate uh, that, are, uh, that are meant to create death for people. For example, the Christchurch mosque shooting. If a newspaper had posted uh, these kind of um, manifestos, they would be charged. Uh, and yet Facebook does it and says, oh, sorry, we're, we, we're going to learn a lesson from it. It's, it's going to come down to the willingness of government to say at a certain point, because these platforms are so powerful, the, po the power to, I think, upend democracy or the power to create mass harms is that much greater. So we need to be able to say there's got to be some accountability mechanisms when we're dealing with that level of, of abuse and hate. And fortunately in Canada, we haven't seen the kind of mass deaths that have occurred in other jurisdictions, but certainly we heard it from our international grand committee from jurisdiction after jurisdiction is dealing with some really severe issues. And the idea that the that there's this protective bubble around uh, the platforms that they're just these really cool kids from California still learning how to make tinker and make things work. It doesn't cut it anymore. Okay, um, I have one more You're question. You're absolutely right. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Ikra Pallet, please. Thank you. Um, and and I, I don't think that uh, that anybody is giving any leeway to social media platforms. I think it's more of uh, finding a way to regulate uh, effectively. Uh, there are models out there uh, and, uh, you know, we, we do need to hold them to account for a lot of the content that is uh, quite extreme, as I'd said earlier. Um, but we also need to ensure that there is enforcement. Uh, we, we do need to look at that, that, that totality of, of what is our justice system around uh, hate laws uh, and, and deal with it in a, in a very effective way. It's one thing to say to Facebook, um, if you don't take down your post within 24 hours, you're going to get a fine. But at the same time, we need to ensure that we as a government have a mechanism of, of enforcing that also mm -hmm. uh, and ensuring that uh, that the content that we're uh, that we're saying should be taken down within 24 hours actually falls within those um, within that realm of, of being harmful. Um, and I think context and social context has really a big part to play. Uh, and until and unless uh, the social media companies actually hire live bodies within our country to look at that data, uh, then I, I think that enforcement piece of it is, uh, is really difficult to, to navigate around. It doesn't mean that it can't be done. Uh, it actually absolutely should be done, but it needs to be that kind of give and take on, on how to get it done and how to ensure that we're enforcing it. Okay. Yeah, there, yeah. Uh, sorry, Bob, I'm just gonna ask you one yeah, question if you like, and sure. then you can, you can uh, squeeze in your answer after that. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ikra Khaled, for that. And if you're looking for mechanisms for enforcement, you can give me a call. I got some ideas. Um, Bob <laughs> Zimmer, uh, just one last question to you before we open it sure. up to the audience for questions. You know, the idea behind uh, social media and the political import of social media is that it increases participation. It gives mm -hmm. voice to people who may have previously been excluded. Yep. Yet, to my knowledge, um, uh, voting, um, the percentage of people who vote has not increased. The number of people who participate in political mm -hmm. parties has not increased. Um, the number of people who are volunteering on political campaigns has not increased. Mm -hmm. We see that there is a cost to candidates and to our democracy and to politics um, associated with uh, people's behavior on social media and the free for all that it enables. Yeah. Um, are we getting anything in exchange for paying that cost that is of value? 
Well, the, the great part of what social media started out to be was to be the new public forum, but online, right? This was mm -hmm. the good thing that I think we'd all acknowledge. I can reach out and Charlie has mentioned this before. We have very remote ridings and very big geographical ridings that we can reach out to constituents a thousand miles away uh, easily with a Facebook post. Uh, half of my communications with my constituents are probably on Messenger or, or some uh, kind of social media communication. So that's the really good part of it. But I think uh, to kind of, I'm going to just steer it a little bit. I think um, what needs to be looked at is the algorithms that some of these social media platforms, uh, how they operate. And we talk about that initial conversation used to be, I think, very good. We, we does, as the old proverb says, iron sharpens iron, right? We would have those conversations. But when we discovered that these social media platforms use, use algorithms to profit from, so amping up political discourse, getting people more angry at each other makes them more money. That's the bottom line. Uh, and that's one of the things that we talk about legislation. One simple thing is algorithmic accountability. Uh, what are the algorithms doing? Are they stirring up dissent? Well, yes, they are. We know they are. So why do we, why does that uh, keep happening? Because it makes the money. So we, you know, there's ways to uh, monetize these uh, platforms, I think that don't need to amp up those, uh, those problematic areas. We haven't even talked about foreign inter interference. Uh, one thing we saw in the US election, there was interference on the left and the right. And it was from foreign actors that were just stirring up dissent and chaos. Mm -hmm. So some of these, these, uh, you know, um, Facebook, um, um, uh, folks that we don't even know if they're real that might be bots that are deliberately stirring up dissent uh, just to cause chaos and the example I use often is that, you know if I'm sitting in my car and somebody comes and spills a cup of coffee in my lap that kind of ruins half of my day well, well these bots or whatever foreign actors do they, they spill cups of coffee in all of our laps and, and cause chaos for us um, so anyway, I think there's a lot that could be done on foreign interference and some of the algorithms and many other things like you said, uh, Daniel, as well. There's ways to just get them to improve and we haven't really even uh, started with them, uh, chipping away at them yet. Uh, some of the platforms have done a bit on their own, but uh, there's a long ways to uh, The last thing I'll say, uh, one thing we learned uh, very early on in our committee work, uh, these social media platforms and big tech are moving at a thousand miles an hour and legislation is moving at about a mile an hour and they know it and they're taking advantage of that slowness of, mm -hmm. of our response to what they're doing and they're making a whole bunch of money in, in between. So we have to figure out a way to still preserve that public square where we can have a good conversation between a liberal conservative and NDP member of parliament that's very civil and we actually learn from each other. We need to preserve that part of it but but try and get rid of the other stuff. Thank you. And, and you know, referring to your committee, to the Grand Committee and the, the Canadian um, Ethics Committee's role in this, I think this was a really impressive um, demonstration of what Canada can contribute. Mm -hmm. um, your knowledge um, um, was really exceptional. And when I attended the Grand Committee uh, meeting uh, in Ottawa in May of 2019, um, it, that was a really impressive cross-partisan piece of uh, piece of work yeah. and, and a model a model for the world. So thank you, yeah. um, thank you. For, for your participation in that. Okay, uh, we are going to go to questions from uh, from the audience. They've been coming in uh, fast and furious here. Um, if you would still like to pose a question, please do. Um, click at the bottom and uh, ask away. Um, I'd like to uh, bring in. Uh, for our first question, Professor Torek, who's been waiting here uh, uh, super patiently. Probably I've been waiting saying, to hear Heidi, so yeah. uh, go Heidi. He's <laughs> uh, probably saying, who is this bald guy and his stupid questions? Um, and why can't he ask about the important things? So uh, Heidi, I'm going to put it to you, and I'm going to come back to a question that I raised earlier um, that, um, that, that someone has posed here. Um, a lot of conversation that is mean or nasty um, uh, in social media from partisan actors may be okay. It's, um, it's maybe noxious, it's maybe uh, impolite, but it's not illegal. It's not anything that we would consider banning. However, it does sometimes wind people up um, who then uh, take their grievances uh, into the real world. And we know, um, you know, you and I did an event in September with Catherine McKenna, who talked about her family being under police protection as a result of people taking these threats very seriously. So um, it starts out okay, but you never really know uh, uh, what the, what the knock-on effect is going to be. And so our questioner says, you know, what, um, 
what rules or guidelines should be considered for politicians, given that it's impossible to control uh, what happens with their commentary after uh, it is put out, even if the original intervention itself is on site. Yeah, thank you. And thanks so much for organizing. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. So I would say that um, this is a multi-pronged problem. So alas, uh, I can't come to you with one silver bullet. And we've already in our conversation, I think, run the gamut from what an individual MP can do, like Charlie Angus talking about having his own plan for what constitutes for him, can, what, I, what I would call another research is like Maish Tabwada called constructive conversation. So not just conversation where we tear each other down, but what constructive conversation needs him having a plan and communicating that so that if people are blocked or removed, they actually understand why. So that's one level of, of what we can think about. What can candidates do? Um, another level is from uh, political parties. So should political parties, for example, be providing more support and resources for candidates. So we, we have three MPs here who are all um, experienced, smart, know this topic, but there are often people who are, for example, thinking about getting into politics where this might not be top of mind for them. And so we could think about whether the role of political parties there is to provide some resources and support um, for those who may have uh, quite small campaigns or might not be thinking about this or maybe entering into social media for the first time. Uh, political parties might consider whether they want to create uh, codes of conduct that MPs could all use together, um, could be discussed cross partisan. So that's one other level, the political parties. Um, and then there's the, the role of um, policymakers themselves. We've already started to touch on um, some things that can be done, whether it is clarifying existing laws and also police procedures to make sure that they are um, enforced evenly across candidates. So when we interviewed some people, we found that um, different candidates were having very different experiences when they contacted the police. There weren't clarified procedures um, that were actually consistent. So depending on how high profile you were, for example, that changed how the police reacted. So that's something that we, we might want to think about as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that we can also see one thing to, to get at what the question is saying, you know, what is, what is constructive conversation? Policymakers can think about um, promoting more transparency. One thing that, that Chris alluded to was that we could only look at Twitter and not at Facebook because of the various ways in, in which we were unable to, to access that data. And that's something where um, policymakers can help researchers by creating frameworks for transparency so that um, companies can't sort of point towards other types of laws to, to sometimes justifiably say that they can't uh, give us access. I and mean, then finally, I'd say, of course, that the platforms play a big role here. Um, they are, in a way, what I call content agnostic. This is what Bob Zimmer is, is referring to by saying that what they want is people to be on the platform as long as possible um, so that they can serve you more ads, right? And in essence, most of Facebook's money is made from serving you ads. So they're content agnostic. Whatever content keeps you on the platform, two thumbs up. Um, and what we unfortunately see is that the kind of content that pe keeps people on there is things that make them angry fearful, mostly negative emotions, which we know from long-standing psychological studies are the types of emotions um, that move people towards action. Um, so we can think about then, what does it mean from a platform perspective to design for something different, um, to design for civility, to design for healthier conversations? And, and I'm happy to give more details, but I think it's just a, it's a different way for platforms to think about what they're doing, not as ad tech, not as content agnostic, but as designing for civility. Great. Thank you very much. That was a thorough answer and I wish mm -hmm. we had hours to unpack it. Uh, and we will, but just not today. Uh, just a friendly reminder, if, um, if we could please uh, pace our remarks uh, out of consideration for the translators, um, only so much knowledge can be processed at once. Um, I have a, another question um, here from, uh, from a member of the audience. Um, of whom there are actually about 500 uh, right now, which is really fantastic because it's a lot cheaper to get a Zoom room for 500 people than to find a hall that fits them all. So thank you all for attending. It's one of the benefits of this, of this uh, terrible pandemic that we're in. And uh, I'd like to put this to the members of parliament. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to go first. Um, that's poor moderation on my part, but uh, alas, I can't decide. Is there a fear um, that the online abuse of politicians um, could lead to um, a Canadian version of what we saw in the United States on January the 6th. And uh, this is uh, something that I think is a very good question. 
I often say that the United States um, is not something that we should laugh at. It's a preview of a future that we can choose to avoid. Um, that's you know a, a very abstract way of putting it. But what are your concerns um, about about us going down that road? It, that that was that was very scary. It continues to happen, and that's you know to, to Charlie's point, to Bob's point, um, well, Icarus' point. Everyone said not just an attack on a person, but an attack on the legitimacy of people to participate in democracy at all if they disagree with you, um, and, uh, and, and and taking up arms effectively um, to, to try and shut down dissent. Um, are, are you concerned about uh, something like that? Perhaps not in Canada exactly the same way. They say history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Um, is there a Canadian version of this that we should be uh, cautious of um, that's the question from the floor with a little bit of uh, enhancement for me. So anyone who would like to take it, um, perhaps raise your hand. I'm sure um, each of you has something to add. Yeah, I, I guess um, we are at risk of, of having something. We've had many protests in the Hill. Uh, we've seen uh, protests, peaceful protests as large as 20,000. You know, the I think the, the Right to Life March is a yearly gathering that they're very peaceful. But we've also seen in 2014, somebody came in and uh, wanted to do some of us in. So um, it's always there. I think, what, again, on my concern on the freedom aspect of it, one thing that we value in Parliament is that the public has access to us because it's the public's place. It's their place that, that they've paid for, that they have elected us to go represent them in. So, um, you know, that said, uh, anything can happen uh, in a negative way. But uh, I would say we should do all our all what we can to preserve that place as it's meant to be. It's, it's meant to be the center of our democracy. And even some of the, the limitations, even over COVID, not being able to attend in person, I think we really need to look into that. Um, but anyway, um, concerned by what potentially can happen. But again, I think we should always err on the side of, of keeping that place the people's place. Ikra Khaled, you've got your hand up. Um, are you concerned about um, incivility spiraling into violence in Canada? Perhaps not today, but at some point in future. Um, I think it was a couple of months ago when somebody rammed the gates of our prime minister's residence with a mm -hmm. truck full of guns. Uh, and, uh, and, and that ideology, the, the need to talk to our prime minister came from somewhere. Uh, and, and we wonder how we got to that place. And I think um, what has happened in down south uh, really helps us to understand what the, uh, the severe implications of, uh, of the ability for certain groups to organize on, uh, on social media platforms, what that can, can lead to. I remember in 2017, um, when a, a radio show or a, a, an IPTV show host had uh, threatened to release my home address uh, to people that were just not very happy with me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, I, th the fear is, is quite real. I mean, I don't live alone. Uh, there are young kids in my home. Um, you know, it's, it, the fear is very, very real. And I think um, it is really incumbent for us to understand that and then to act on that. Uh, on that uh, for the preservation of what our democratic system is. I mean, ultimately, I would want, uh, you know, more young women to enter into politics. Uh, I, I don't want them to fear for the safety of themselves or their friends uh, or their own family um, because of, of the role that they're playing in our democratic system. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, yeah. I just have a question for you. Uh, on a oh, I was, gonna an I was gonna answer that question. Okay, you go for it then, go. Well, because I think one of the really powerful things, and I want to echo what Bob Zimmer said, what makes me most proud about being a parliamentarian is that Parliament Hill is the people's hill. Um, you know, you go play Frisbee, you can yoga. Uh, people go and demonstrate without a permit all the time. I have been called over many times by the RCMP to ask if I could go and talk to some of the young people who are protesting. They said, hey, maybe you could just go talk to them, see what they're up to. Um, so that they know who to contact. It's not that they're trying to shut the shut it down, but they're trying to find a way to keep that open. I go to the UK, I don't see that. I go to Washington, I don't see that. I see what we have on Parliament Hill and we need to protect that. Of course, we saw in 2014 with the horrific killing that we were not ready. Uh, we did not have the security measures to keep us safe. But to Madame Khalid's thing about you know the threat, I'm very much more concerned about the threat right now to personal 
members of parliament or public figures. Um, I had a situation this summer where someone on Facebook uh, went from making a few cracks about me to a full on heavy, heavy, heavy uh, attack on me that lasted every single day for over two months. It was a very public, um, it was very concerning. I was dealing with constituents every day who were very freaked out. And what I realized from that, because I just never thought that was going to happen to me, was that I didn't really have much support at Parliament. Um, I was having to deal with the police. I was having to deal with the Crown Attorney's Office. And when you're an ordinary citizen and you're dealing with a neighbor who's fighting with you over a fence and they go a little crazy, there are really heavy levels that you actually have to establish in order to get restraining orders and that. And I was trying to explain uh, to police. And finally, the police really got their heads around it. I said, I'm a public figure. And as a public figure, it's one of the privileges of parliament that I cannot be intimidated from my work. I have an obligation to serve the people and, I sh and intimidation is a threat to, my, to the democratic rights, not of me, but of my constituents. Those rights are protected on Parliament Hill where we have tons of police and security, but the vast majority of us do our work out in public. I drive to events by myself all the time. Um, I don't have staff with me, I'm out by myself. So the need I think to have a conversation, and I've spoken with the Sergeant at Arms about this, about how given the, the toxic level of threats, these attempts to arrest the prime minister and attempt to arrest the leader of the New Democratic Party by someone who just tried to grab him on the street, um, the killing of Joe Cox, that we need to actually say, how do we have a better conversation with yeah. police, with Crown and the regions? Because what we face now is when I got elected, these kind of things would never even been dreamed of, but now it's a possibility. And I think that that's the conversation. If we just have a yeah. better sense of what we would do in terms of dealing with individual threats, because my concern is that without that, one of our MPs or some provincial member will be a victim of someone doing something really wrong because they've been amped up or they're they're off and and it's and it, we could have a tragedy mm -hmm. um it, it is a it is a really concerning uh situation i uh, am inclined to agree with you we've got just under 15 minutes left to go and um, um for those of you who probably have to nod off for your next uh, next meeting i just want to thank uh, those participants for coming here i've been getting a lot of questions uh, our twitter feed at friends cb has been uh, lighting up with questions. So if you'd like to keep up the conversation, please follow us there and send us a message and we'd be glad to follow up with you. Um, I know that there are a lot of policymakers uh, on this call uh, from various levels of government, provincial government. Um, I, well, I don't know who showed up, but at least they registered. <laughs> um, and so we have a, a great degree of interest uh, from people with a, with a practical uh, lens and who can, can, can um, potentially implement some solutions. Um, uh, Professor Torek, Heidi, I wanted to just ask you a question and get you back in here. Um, Charlie Angus just spoke about supports that can be available in Parliament um, for members of Parliament and people seeking political office, but people seeking office are not protected by Parliament. Um, what recourse is available um, for people, especially um, um, as they relate to the platforms, to um, have this content against them and the people who are putting it up removed um, or, or, or censored or reported to police. Um, we've heard many examples, Minister McKenna again said that, you know, Facebook refused to cooperate with the RCMP in telling who was uh, threatening her life and her family, citing, and here I had to laugh, uh, the privacy <laughs> of, uh, of, of the people yeah. involved. Yeah, says the company who paid $5 billion for lying about uh, uh, protecting people's privacy. Um, yeah. And so uh, there, there is a question of what recourse is available to individual people. They can sue in court perhaps, but that is a long process, which is very emotionally and financially expensive, unavailable to most people. Um, how can people, absent larger regulatory reform, how do people stand up for themselves against this type of behavior? What has been your experience? And has the inability to do so prevented people from participating in public life in the first place? Yeah, thanks. So there are, I think, multiple layers to that question. So mm -hmm. I'll try and just unpack a few of them. Um, the first is that every platform is a little bit different. So this is what researchers call affordances. What does the platform enable you to do? For example, block lists, 
muting people and so on and so forth. So, so Twitter versus Facebook um, versus TikTok, et cetera, each one of them has different tools. Um, so we've seen that in our interviews, different candidates and staff took quite different approaches, but often what would happen is that there would have to be a staff member or somebody else um, dealing with this. So one of the things that was problematic for candidates who had smaller staffs is then instead of spending your time with your constituents or having discussions, you're actually spending uh, some of your staff time and emotional labor dealing with this. So that's one subset of the problem. And the other is that a lot of the tools uh, may not be that helpful when you're really having a huge volume um, because often, and these tools are evolving, but um, often it can take you a very long time to deal with a large volume. Um, so that's another one of the problems. Um, the other issue is, is one of where we are. Um, which is that these platforms are ultimately, most of them, uh, based in the United States. And what we see is that they're far more responsive to what happens in the US um, in terms of, for example, uh, elections. So I'll just give you one example, uh, which is that um, Twitter doesn't actually give a, a blue check to every uh, political candidate within Canada, whereas they will do that for somewhere like the US. So um, the Catherine McKenna's experience, if we think that she's very high profile, um, can potentially be mirrored by many, many others. Um, for example, lots of MLAs, say in BC, also don't have a blue check, even though they're actually uh, elected members of the Legislative Assembly. So that can mean that it just simply doesn't get as much attention because it's Canada versus somewhere else. We argue in the report a very basic thing, which is that elections in every country are important. And so we need to have much better communication so that if MPs do have these kind of problems, uh, they get that kind of access to really understanding what's going on. Um, but even mm -hmm. beyond that, uh, for ordinary people too. And then the final thing is, is the point you make about uh, what happens when this gets really violent, what can possibly uh, be done? And that's, I think, a place for policymakers to think about, as I've said, standardizing police procedures, what kind of education is needed so that the problems that Charlie Angus uh, described don't recur, um, but also what needs to happen in terms of the data that is provided by platforms, um, if this is indeed illegal content. So as you can see, there's multiple different layers of, of what needs to be done to think about these kinds of problems. They are uh, complex, but at the moment they take up a lot of staff time, emotional labor, um, and also uh, concern for the safety of some MPs as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. On the question of emotional labor, uh, Bob Zimmer, I've got a question for you, and, and then I'd like to um, close with one last question, again, following up on a point that, um, that Heidi has just made. Um, mm -hmm. Your job is to serve your constituents, not to defend yourself online. And I agree that politicians um, have have a, have a right to operate free of this type of abuse, as, as does everybody, but I think political figures in particular. Um, one way of dealing with this, of course, is blocking people. Um, mm -hmm. But um, a lot of people don't uh, take kindly to that. Uh, <laughs> I think that any act of blocking somebody by a politician is somehow yeah. violating uh, democracy. I know you've been subject to this, the leader of the Bloc yeah. Québécois, um, has been subject to blocking controversies, pun unavoidable. Um, what, what do you, uh, what, what's your, what's your take on this, Bob? Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. And Charlie alluded to it earlier. Um, the way that I would compare it to, cause some say, well, you know, you, you're, um, a defender of free speech. So therefore you have to listen to me yell at you on the street corner. And I just would use the comparison, uh, of a physical interaction with somebody. If somebody was yelling at me in front of me and pointing me, uh, poking me in the chest, I probably wouldn't stand there very long. And I'd say, look, if you want to talk further, just call my office or, or do it some other way. So uh, some of the content, uh, if ever I block somebody, I have a very similar standard to what Charlie says. If they're uh, clearly not wanting to discuss an issue, they just want to either call me names and be rude or disrespectful. Uh, I used to be a teacher. I had a real simple rule that we had to respect each other in the classroom. And I have that same standard. If you're not going to have a respectful dialogue, then uh, that's it. So, um, but it's not, it's different to say that that person that might be yelling at me should be arrested for it. If they're not harming me physically, I think that you, they should still have the freedom to get off their chest what they want to get off their chest. Again, if, as long as it's not harmful. Uh, threatening my, my uh, like the one tweet that I had here, I just wanted to mention, uh, hey, Bob Zimmer, I wish Hamas had a better aim in 2014. Maybe it would have taught you and the Tories a lesson on imperialism. That was just one of many uh, that we get. But, but I don't, that one almost crosses the line, I'd say. Uh, 
but ones that have maybe a, a controversial or rude opinion that I don't want to necessarily hear for the next two hours, I still don't think that person should be arrested for yelling at me. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a difference. So they, they have the freedom to do it. I just may not stand there and listen to them. There's a difference. Uh, we're talking about illegality and things and harmful uh, to the person stuff here. And I think there's, there's two, that it's kind of apples and oranges to me, but that's, uh, I know it's quite a thing. And uh, I think every politician has probably had to block one or two people uh, just uh, with being um, uh, offensive, frankly. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's part of the job. Sadly, I know ECRA has referred to it already. You know, we want to have good people um, uh, come into this political sphere from all parties. We want good people uh, representing us, but it makes it really difficult when you have to run this gauntlet uh, of social media. Mm -hmm. I'll ask one last question and um, I'll ask um, Ikra and Charlie to decide amongst themselves who wants to take it just because we don't have very much time left. Uh, Heidi did allude to the fact that uh, companies like Twitter and Facebook, for example, may behave different, uh, differently towards uh, the directives of authorities in the United States as opposed to in Canada or other countries. Um, uh, Charlie mentioned uh, safe harbor provisions uh, for those of you uh, who are uh, um, not uh, plagued with the obligation to review the communications laws of the United States. This is a reference to um, uh, legal uh, philosophy in the United States that a company like Facebook, which is responsible for disseminating the speech of others, should not be held legally responsible for that speech. And there's a long uh, uh, history of why that is the case. Um, in Canada, though, um, that was not the law um, until uh, the recent trade deal has suggested that perhaps it might be. So we do have different standards. We do have different laws here than in the United States. Um, what is it going to take for um, Canada to ensure that these companies uh, comply with our laws and rules instead of imposing the laws and rules of their home jurisdiction or which they uh, deem convenient? Um, uh, on to us and the other way around. How can we regain sovereignty um, over our own uh, over our, our own political arena? That's going to be my last question for you. Well, uh, Facebook was found so guilty. I'll guess I'll start. Oh, oh, sorry, Charlie got in there first, which means go you got to be Charlie. quick, Charlie, because Icar is going to finish. Go ahead. Go okay, ahead, well, Charlie. I'll just I'll just go shortly. I mean, Facebook was found guilty by our privacy commissioner, and I said thanks a lot. Um, that's your opinion. Um, can you imagine a corporation ever before telling us, thanks for your opinion about breaking the laws and there was no accountability? And we still haven't taxed Facebook. Uh, I mean, they don't pay tax in Canada and they make an enormous amount of money. So uh, I don't know why we keep wringing our hands about this. Um, and, I, and like Bob, you know, Facebook has been enormously powerful for me in my region, isolated communities, people able to converse. I think it's a powerful platform, but the fact that they don't pay tax in this country is absurd. The fact that we still talk about it and how we're gonna come up with legislation, we should just tax them like everybody else. Mm -hmm. End of story. Um, you know, they break our laws, they have to pay fines. The idea that they can take us to court to fight our laws when we have a privacy commissioner to me is ridiculous. Um, okay. So. I'm End of story. To, we should just follow the rules. I'm going to pass it to Ikra, but I'll just comment again. Uh, Kevin Chan, Facebook's re representative in Canada, told Parliament two weeks ago that uh, the company welcomes additional privacy legislation uh, at the same time as they are fighting in court to say that our privacy commissioner has no jurisdiction over them. Another irony, contradiction um, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the company before Parliament. There seem to be many of them. Ikra Khaled, the last word uh, falls to you. How can we regain sovereignty over our own political debate and the rules that govern? Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. And I, I, I do want to reiterate a lot of what has been said. Um, absolutely, uh, social media platforms need to be more responsible in uh, the information that they disseminate. But uh, we also, uh, as a government, as, as a citizenry, need to understand um, the benefits of having that platform. For example, um, you know, uh, for, for our national security, for our public safety, 
um, our ability to monitor the accounts um, that are that are uh, public uh, across the country uh, has led us to being able to recognize terrorist organizations um, that are operating through these social media platforms. Does more need to be done? Absolutely. But does it need to be done with the ensuring that we can and Canadians can still continue to benefit uh, from having these uh, these platforms available to them, absolutely. I think freedom of expression is a core value of, of what any democracy is. Um, I think we need to continue to, and I know that our government is working on um, the ability to regulate and to hold social media uh, companies to account beyond what is their profit lines uh, and to also take social responsibility uh, for, for, for what occurs on their platforms as well. Uh, and that work is being done. Great. Thank you. Um, this has been a fantastic event. Um, we have uh, answered a couple questions. We have presented a whole host more. Uh, but I think the urgency of the situation has been made very clear. And the fact that inaction is unacceptable has also been made clear. The impacts um, are, are indisputable. So I'd like to thank you. For those of you who wish to keep up the conversation in a civilized way, of course, uh, you can do so by uh, following us on Twitter at FriendsCB and uh, messaging us that way. Or you can visit us online at friends.ca. I would like to thank our guests, members of parliament, Ifra Khalid, Charlie Angus, and Bob Zimmer for joining us. I would like to thank Chris Tanov and Heidi Torek, Heidi Torek of the University of British Columbia for their excellent research and for um, rendering it into such perfect context for today's discussion. And I'd like to thank uh, Adelina Putsivuryu uh, from our partners at the Samara Center for Democracy, not only for all the excellent work that they do every day, um, but also for helping us in uh, this event. And finally, having spoken so quickly against my own injunction to our translators today um, mm -hmm. for uh, their dutiful work, uh, and for putting up with uh, with my transgressions and uh, and those lesser transgressions of our panelists. That is all for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and Thank I you. look forward to continuing the conversation with each of you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thanks.